Born in Cleveland, raised a hillbilly. What's your story? Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. Here's your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. Welcome to the Hillbilly Justice on the School Bus podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Blossom Ware. Today I'll be reading a chapter called Salt and Sav, a.k.a. Henry Gets Potty Trained. Granny was very knowledgeable in the art of hillbilly home remedies. Sometimes she would rub Linman on her sore calves in the evenings. This was interesting because it was a process that I never saw at home and because it was the only time we ever saw Granny's calves. The scent was a very poignant mix of mint and medicine. Open wounds called for rubbing alcohol, followed by fresh aloe vera from a piece that was broken from Granny's large potted plant in the living room. Chronic coughing required a spoonful of salt. If you don't think this sounds too bad, then you've never eaten a spoonful of salt all at once by itself. I remember holding my breath and concentrating really hard on something in the distance in hopes of staving the urge to cough. Passing out would have also been warmly welcomed. Anything to avoid having to eat that spoonful of salt. If one spoonful didn't do the trick, another would be administered. Maybe it really worked. I don't remember eating more than two spoonfuls. Maybe I passed out. I was five and George was four when we started going to Granny's house, but Henry was just a baby. There came a time when Henry was three years old that Granny grew impatient with my parents' failed efforts to potty train Henry and decided to kindly assist in this endeavor. Granny had an old ringer washer, the kind with an upright barrel. The washing machine was in the bathroom, which is rather fitting for this story. It was actually a laundry room slash bathroom slash food pantry, but the food pantry part is irrelevant for this story. Granny filled the barrel of the washing machine and then gave Henry fair warning that the next time he peed his pants, she was going to immerse him in scalding hot water. It wasn't long before Henry did indeed pee his pants. Granny ran over and scooped him up, and we ran over to see if Granny was really going to go through with it. Henry was petrified as Granny took him into the bathroom, held him over the barrel, announced again that it was filled with scalding hot water, and then dunked him in. Henry screamed bloody murder. It's hot! I'm burning! We stood there staring in shock. Then Granny started rocking back and forth, cackling like a hen. She pulled Henry out of the water and dried him off. She took on an instructional tone and calmly explained to us that the water was actually freezing cold but that the stinging sensation of the cold water, combined with the image that she'd embedded in Henry's mind, just made him think that the water was really scalding hot. Henry was potty trained from that day forward and also scarred for life. Poor Henry, bless his heart, was also an avid thumb sucker. Well, it just so happened that Granny had a remedy for that too. She would dip his thumb in turpentine while he was napping. I think I also speak for my brother George when I say, praise God that I was already potty trained and did not suck my thumb when I met Granny. Okay. (coughs) (coughs) Granny. Character. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) All right. So, um, do six word intros and then... Um, so what have you been busy with lately? And then we'll do questions. Okay. Ready? Okay, we are ready. About 27 minutes left. Yeah. Okay, thank you for listening in again to the podcast. Today we have Abdullah and Monica with us as um, discussion panel members. So welcome. To you guys, and I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourselves um, with your six-word summaries. Monica Lee Tischler, um, born in NYC, lived in Tennessee. My name is Abdullah Beg, uh, youngest of three, pursuing an MD. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so if you would like to hear more about our 
discussion panel members um, just listened to a couple podcasts back and they've um, talked a little bit more about their backgrounds. And of course, um, this, so this is the third um, time that they're with us. So they've talked quite a bit more about um, other things as well. So thank you again for being on the discussion panel. Um, the, the thing I would like to do before we start talking about um, all kinds of things is to do a segment that I call, So What Have You Been Busy With Lately? Abdullah, so what have you been busy with lately? Uh, so for one of your classes, actually, Dr. Ware, uh, we have to volunteer uh, and get a certain amount of hours. So I, I've volunteered in the past with uh, different associations and different things. But right now for your class, I did a lot of research into trying to find where to volunteer. And so I ended up finding this place called SciTech Museum. And it's it's really cool because it, it, it's a museum for children. And uh, so when, when I volunteer there, uh, they actually have like field trips for little kids. And they have these hand-built, every, everything inside there is like hand-built, um, like techno technology and different uh, contraptions basically for the kids to play with, uh, at, which teaches them science. So they had like a wind tunnel, which talks about tornadoes so they could learn those things. And then they recently, they just uh, unveiled a like space exploration thing. Uh, so they had this like weird like telescope thing that you could see inside and that's like, kind of like looking inside into like a black hole would be and really interesting things like that. And they have all kinds of things that have been hand built for over like 20 to 30 years, I believe. It's, it's a really old museum. So when I when I started volunteering there, we basically either like take inventory of all the different things there are, or we help with actually creating some of these newer ones because a lot of the a lot of the things that are there are old. Uh, one of my favorites is actually, uh, it's like these tubes that travel through kind of the building and they come from one side of the building to the other side. And when you speak into it, it shows how the sound waves travel through the through the tubes and they, they come directly onto the other side. So I, I found something cool like that. And I realized that when going to, you know, like a younger age, going to school, I kind of never had any like knowledge of things like that. So it's really cool what they're doing at SciTech um, with the with the field trips and having all these cool things. Have you learned any new science with this, uh, or maybe just applied the stuff that you're learning in I, I, class? Well, actually, yeah, probably applying because uh, they they had like these things um, talking about saving water. So it showed like uh, different water pressures and how they travel and how it's cost efficient to wh where to place d different faucets. So that's like, I, I personally didn't learn about that in class, but just looking at the pressure, you know, where, how much pressure you can get into your sink depends on how high you have the piping. And that's just like learning something like that at early age, even though you might not fully understand it at, at the age, because usually it's like kids from like second grade, but they, they told me that kids from like high school come there to do like science related projects but learning something at that age i mean you might not use it at the time but growing up you'd be like hey, you know i, I kind of learned that and so like say if you go into engineering that might come in handy you could be like i learned this <laughs> at a museum and you can use that so specifically I, I personally didn't that's like one of the examples i guess but it's, that's just one of the examples is it in Chicago? It's in Aurora, actually. Oh, it's not too far. Yeah, it's it's not too far. I never knew about it, so it's it's really cool how they have it's so hands on because usually you go to like museums and everything says do not touch, mm -hmm. so you kind of really want your hands you want to you know you want to touch everything and see how it works, and so going in there the first time I I went there I was like a kid like I was even though I was twenty one like I went there like a couple weeks ago and. I was like playing with every possible thing. I was like, whoa, this is so cool. And like the the lady that was like the volunteer coordinator, she was like, go ahead, have fun. Because like, <laughs> I, I, I've never been to this place. And I'm like looking at everything. And they actually had this cool setup of, uh, it was like a camera and like you, you had all these like different buttons and they had a green screen. 
and so you could stand in front of the green screen and pretend like you're doing the news. So you you hit the button, it goes lights, like all these flashing lights turn on, and you have a little screen. So you're like the producer, basically, and your friend could stand by the green screen, and then it's like the music starts playing and the green screen has like you could choose either sports weather or like normal news and like behind the green screen the weather pops up so you could like actually like stand there and like like produce basically a whole like newscast and i thought that was so cool like i was just playing with like the lights and you turn on like the red light and that was just fantastic and to experience that at a young age i'm sure the kids like definitely love something like that well, it's important to get kids interested in science. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll have to take mine there. I never heard. Yeah, and you guys are both from, like, a science background, obviously. So it was just really, like, they had so many different things. And what I found interesting is everything over there is hand-built. And there's, like, engineers and, like, other volunteers basically running the place. And it has a lot of, a lot of history, especially because it was – it's actually a historical site in Aurora because it used to be their old post office. So they can't really structurally change the building much. They have to leave it. So they take whatever, like, the building that has, and they build all these weird, like, contraptions and cool science projects, basically, into the place. So that was – that's very cool, in my opinion. So what are some of the new things that you're building um, well, I haven't really started building anything yet because I'm just, you know, like a volunteer. But one of the um, – I know I was speaking to one of the main persons that does build it, uh, build, like, some of the equipment in there. And so um, he's he's working on some, like, gravity-type things and to, to teach students about gravity and things like that. So I personally haven't started building anything yet. So it's probably a place that if you have ideas, they would be willing to Definitely, accept yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so let's talk about some of these questions here. Um, so based around the chapter Salt and Sav, I thought it could be interesting to ask what are some home remedies that your parents or your grandparents have used, um, maybe non-traditional kind of things. Uh, personally, I don't know if it, this is non-traditional, but my mom, every time I had a sore throat, she would uh, give me salt water, salty water to That's gargle. A very, very traditional. Yeah. And old fashioned. Kind right. Of and I never knew that, you know, I was like, oh, my mom is so cool. She came up with this thing. And I, <laughs> I, I actually never knew how it worked until microbio uh, with Dr. Tischler and, you know, the salt content and the bacteria and stuff. So that was that was pretty cool that. I was. I always thought my mom is a genius for thinking of something like this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's just your mom <laughs> is a genius. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she is. <laughs> hey, you have any? I I have. I don't know. This uh, people are going to think that my mother is not just a bad cook, but is cruel. But when I had chicken pox, I had chicken pox in the summer, and I had chicken pox in an unair-conditioned house, which didn't have a whole lot of ventilation. It was a small house that we lived in. And each room had a window, but there was no cross ventilation. And so I was very hot. I was very itchy. And I also had prickly heat, which is also itchy. So I had prickly heat and I had chicken pox. And I was miserable. And my mother, for some reason, thought that you should put oatmeal on it. And I know that you can have like this oatmeal bath stuff, but my mother did not do it well or she put something cream of wheat. I don't know what she did because <laughs> we would eat cream of wheat, not oatmeal. And she put it on and it was sticky and it was even worse. So then she let helped me wash it off. I was maybe five or six. I I probably was five at the time. And then what she did, because she didn't want me to scratch, because she didn't want me to get pock marks or something, she took my hands and she put them in socks and then she tied them together so that I wouldn't scratch. And she called them my chicken pox mittens. <laughs> And I remember I, I was I was probably about five, and I remember this so distinctly, lying in my bed, 
I couldn't look at picture books because my hands were tied together. It wasn't like I was watching TV or anything else because that wasn't the, you know, we had one TV downstairs and I was lying in bed with my hands tied together, sweating. So I remember my chicken pox, my, my, the, my hands and socks tied together. And I recently brought this up to my mother and my kids were talking about it. And my mother goes, oh, you were wearing your chicken pox mittens. I remember that. <laughs> and I just remember it as being very close to child cruelty. <laughs> and so I will tell you what I did when my daughters got the chicken pox. My daughters got the chicken pox. I took a, um, I, I took a sort of rubber sheet or some sort of drop cloth or something. And we pulled out the couch that was in our living room and I let them watch videos and I let them sit there in their panties. And they, I got little custard cups with calamine lotion and they, cause they both had chicken pox at the same time. And I got them each a um, paintbrush and they got to paint each other's pox marks. And they remember that very fondly. So <laughs> they remember that fondly. And of course, people are going to be vaccinated now, so they're not going to get the chicken pox. But I just remember sweating, not able to read a book, not able to play with toys, just lying there on the bed with my hands tied together. Was it a feeling of, do you remember it? Because it was like, a desperate kind of a feeling. I was you so angry yeah. and so frustrated. <laughs> and my poor mother must have been so harried because my brother had the chicken pox at the same time. Oh, wow. And he was younger than I was. And I, I don't remember anything else about that. I just remember being so angry and so frustrated. Did he get the mittens? He must have. I don't know. I, I <laughs> have to ask him that. <laughs> oh, man. But your mom thinks she was doing the right thing still. She, I mean, of course she thinks she was doing yeah. the right thing. Right? It's, I, I, that frustration, though, when you're in restraints, I because at the hospital now, I work at the hospital, and we have patients where they're restrained. Like, you know, some if they have some kind of issue, you know, if it's a psychological issue or, you know, they have like a scrape and they keep tending to itch it. We put mitts on them, and that's that's like a form of restraint. And they don't; they just get so irritated at the fact that they're restrained. Like they they don't understand that it's for their own safety. But it's just I think it's just a feeling of being restrained, knowing that you can't do something. It just bothers them so much. And I feel like as a child, that was probably what was making you mad because I, I can't I can't be restrained like that. Just, well, and thinking about it now. There's absolutely no reason I couldn't have gotten out of my bedroom. My mother probably said, you stay there. You stay in bed. I mean, I'm sure, you know, I could have gone up and run around the house or done something terribly naughty. And I probably just didn't didn't occur to me. To, Did you try to... getting out of the restraints or you just left them? Like... I just, I, I just, I don't remember. I don't remember that. I just, just remember being so angry. <laughs> <laughs> so angry and I I had to I couldn't have been more than five you have a lot of very vivid memories from really early well I I have memories from even earlier than that I mean okay. some people have memories mm -hmm. uh -huh. I, I probably there's probably a lot that I don't remember oh that's you so you should write them down I guess I could. You and I could. I ju just like you. <laughs> yeah. You did a good job writing all oh, your thank memories. You. It's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, and, and part of this, you know, is you guys are thinking about things you probably haven't thought about in a while, oh. which is it's actually kind of a neat, you know, you kind of, it's, it's strange, but you kind of have to intentionally go there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, something's not like the, you know, the certain, like a smell or a song yeah. or something, but, but like to really think about it. Yeah, that was it was interesting for me to do. So I recommend it to you guys, to everybody. But write it all down, because then you can, you know, you can ask your mom, and she can go, "No, that was a happy story," and you go, "No, it was, <laughs> it was horrible." <laughs> I'm still talking about it. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, this question I always like to throw out at some point for, um, you know, for each panel discussion group 
because and it's one my mom came up with like early on and is I just really like the answers that I get so I keep throwing it out there um so was there something from your childhood that you didn't find out the whole story about until much later so it's based on an earlier much earlier chapter in the book when my dad and my brothers went for a walk in the woods and they came back and my brothers had no shoes on and my mom never could figure out the whole story until just a few years ago my dad told her what happened so um just wondering if there's something like that for either of you or both of you well i know i've spoken about my grandmother these are this is my paternal grandmother who i loved very very much and um the person that i called grandpa her husband actually was not my birth grandfather my um grandmother had been married earlier and her husband had actually left her which was horrible shame in the 1930s and um she remarried the person I called grandpa. He adopted my father, um, and they had another child. And I didn't know this, of course, until much, much later, although there were some things that had my father's birth name on them, and that was always sort of poo-pooed away, and you sort of just never knew about that. But we never really talked about that. And it wasn't until on, I was an adult that I learned that my grandfather had left Germany. He, um, it, he was also a very interesting person. If you would ask him what he had done, he had been what he called a horse boy, which was a groom. It had to have been a groom during World War I for the German army. And um, he was the younger son, so he did not inherit the family business in Berlin. And so he left. He was an economic refugee from Germany because it was very, very poor after World War I um, between the wars. And so he was an economic refugee. And he – and I actually don't know the story whether he had been married or he had just a fiancé who refused to come with him to this country – and as Jews, they were all – he lost everyone who had been in Germany. And that was just something never, ever discussed in our family. Not ever. But he had lost everyone um, in the family. And he and my grandmother um, – this was something we just never, ever discussed growing up, that my father was adopted, that he had come to this country – and it wasn't something that I had learned, and I, I never really pieced all of that together until actually I was an adult mm -hmm. to, to, to find, find out that that was something never talked about, whether it was divorce, whether it was the Holocaust, whether it was any of those things. Those were just not topics of discussion. It took a while for me to piece all of that together. The kids accept so much, just, you know, accept it. Yeah. And, right. You know, right. I don't know. So did you find out anything about those stories though or they're lost? Um a lot of them are lost. I learned about it in in bits and pieces. So my grandfather had a sister and towards the end of the 1930s um when it was desperate, people were desperate to get out of um Germany. My grandfather raised 10 thousand dollars can you imagine how much ten thousand dollars was at that time mm -hmm. and when i say my pa grandparents were poor my grandfather told stories about having to sell his blood to make sure that there was money uh, excuse me money to put food on the table okay my middle name is lee my grandfather's name was levy and he changed his name so that he could get a job selling insurance i mean so seriously these are people the idea of raising $10,000 in 1937, and they bribed people and brought my grandfather's sister and her husband to the United States. Three weeks later, three months later, within a year, she was dead because she was hit in a traffic accident. Wow. And that money was just gone. But they had bribed. They were able to get one family member out, and that was it, through bribes. Wow. And again, I didn't hear any of that until until 
oh, I was an adult. That was just not talked about at all. Things are talked about more now, but not when I was growing up. Not at all. Hmm. That's, that's a yeah. I wish you know. You wish that you had those back. I mean, I'm sure. I I don't know that yeah. they would have talked about it. You oh. know, mm-hmm. I I just don't know if they would have talked about it at all. Yeah. I mean, my grandfather would tell stories about World War One and being a horse boy, and about his responsibility for the horses and all of those kinds of things. But, and he would tell stories about how poor they were in Germany and how bad. Things were economically, right, and eating where they didn't have food to eat and things like that, which is why he came to the United States. He came to the United States really before persecutions began. But nonetheless, he lost his entire family. He tried very hard to get his family back, tried to get his family to the United States. It's very Mm -hmm. difficult, very difficult. And he again, went through an awful lot of things to be able to have, they had nothing, to have enough to support my grandfather, uh, my grandmother, and then his two children. Uh, wow. <laughs> Can you imagine going through something like that? It's just... I, uh, but people do that. People mm-hmm. are doing that now, mm-hmm. right? People, right. Are, people are fleeing persecution mm-hmm. now. So it's, it's not limited to one thing, but again, that was something that was never discussed. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I, you know, pieced things together. Even my father um, doesn't talk about his birth father or, you know, just that was it. That was that was what happened. Things are, are much more open now. Yeah, as time goes on, I guess they became more open, right? Right. Well, people would talk about – people will talk about divorce now, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's okay to be divorced. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It, right. it wasn't back then. Well, and actually, my grandmother, this very proper woman who I've talked about in a previous podcast, she apparently moved in with my grandfather before they were married, too. <laughs> the, the one that let you stay. <laughs> <laughs> apparently. Well, she, she, had a, she had a small, she had a young young son, right? She had my father. She had she had a very young son and he moved in the week before they got married. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that was a scandal. In the I'm sure it was. I'm in, the sure 19, it was. in the 1930s, I am sure that was a terrible scandal. <laughs> wow. What do you got, Abdullah, on this so topic? I, I definitely do not have a story that interesting like Dr. Tischler. Um, <laughs> And I'm sure I, I'm, it's not yeah, trying it's, to one up, but no, I have a I little know. bit more life experience. Definitely, definitely, yeah. <laughs> more choices for stories. <laughs> definitely. Um, and at 21, let me tell you, I wouldn't have known this story. Uh-huh. I didn't know this story when I was 21. I knew little bits and pieces of it, but it was really a skeleton in the. Cl- mm-hmm. It's not really a skeleton, but it was really a skeleton in the closet. Definitely. Uh, my story, I would just say it's just a story of innocence. Uh, growing up, I never knew how babies were born. And my parents, and I feel like generally in my culture, uh, being an Indian background, we don't really have a talk with, you know, the children, like the birds and the bees and stuff like that. So I, until high school, I never knew how children were born. And I never really questioned it. I just, I, I don't know why, I, it never struck me to think about, hey, where did, like, this person come from, like, and, you know, I would see, like, you know, younger cousins, I would see all these people, but I just never questioned where, what is birth, what, like, how are children born, up until high school, when, in science class, I learned, okay, this is the process, and this is how a child is born, and I was just like, wow, like, I never thought about that before. <laughs> so that was just, like, an eye-opener for me. And I was I was really amazed by that, actually, you know, after learning it and, like, the actual process and everything going, you know, going on in there. It's, it's not simple. And growing up, when you hear, like, oh, the birds and the bees and stuff, that's just, like, I feel like, personally, from the beginning, you should try to teach your child, like, directly, like, this is, you know, something that happens instead of, I mean, yeah, they might not didn't, understand didn't it. Didn't you do, like, the fifth grade health class talk? I, I don't recall. I, like, I, I mean, I'm talking about, like, the details I learned more in high school. I did not, like, I 
in the health class and stuff like I don't remember. Because I know they separate at mm -hmm. least in public school that it's fifth mm -hmm. grade they separate the boys and the girls and they sort of give them that I don't, talk. Yeah, I don't think they did that at my school. Maybe you were absent that day. Possibly. I, I don't remember anything about it until high school in gym class when we had health. And that's when we specifically talked about it and I was mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> so you would have rather like your parents are just open or? Yeah. Well, generally, yeah. I mean, I, I, I like to know everything. Like I, I like yeah. to know the, <laughs> like the details. So, uh, I mean, I guess maybe like they didn't think I needed to know or generally, cause I mean, like, how did you guys tell your kids? Like, did your kids ask, you know, like where do babies come from? I haven't had that direct question, I don't think. You... Well, your kids are younger, though. Yeah. My, my kids, you know, you would always give something that was age appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. not too much detail. <laughs> Just enough detail that, you know, something that was right. age appropriate. Yeah. Mommy and a daddy love each other very right. much, yeah. you know, yeah. from, from uh -huh. something like that yeah. until... Right. Yeah, and I never had any of that, so it's just like, <laughs> and I found it interesting how maybe you I weren't never... a curious little boy. Maybe you didn't ask and that's your parents. A, yeah, that that's question. the thing. I do you have brothers or sisters? Yeah, I, I have two older sisters, and I'm sure they knew. But I never, I never like maybe like assuming that I never. I wanted. I always wanted a younger brother, and I would tell my mom like, "Can we get like? Can we just like?" I thought I was like shopping for a. <laughs> child. Like, I would wondering. always tell her. I was like, "Can we get a little brother? Or can we get a little sister?" Because I have a huge age gap between my my older siblings, you know, it's just like eight to seven year difference. Uh, so I was kind of by, always by myself while they did their own thing. So I would always be like, "Mom, can, like I thought it was just like you go to a store and like kind of like pick one up or something like that." I was like, <laughs> "Mom, can we can we get a younger sibling for me to play with?" Well, I know um, I always teach my kids the correct names for bodily structures, and not everyone does that. And so my kids are the ones that are teaching everyone else's <laughs> kids. Like, the name, sometimes I get some flack from other parents. <laughs> like, there's no shame in the name. It's a scientific name. I'm a scientist. Like, I mean, why well, would rather to call it Hoochie than to call it, you know, <laughs> yeah. the real name? I mean, how is that not gross? Like, that's the way I think of it. So we used correct names, right? Yeah. Correct names for correct. Then there's no shame because there's too much. Like, yeah. there's a shame to it, and there shouldn't be. It says something a body part, right? you can name, you know, like your nose, right? Right. <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of how I. Yeah, and I didn't have that until. Like, <laughs> Until, like, high school, like I said, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, I learned about body parts before high school, but <laughs> putting one to, like, like the two different things, then that, that was till high school. So that's very recent, you know, being 21, that's, like, very recent, and that's, like, a big part of life. That is life. So I think that was just interesting in my situation. <laughs> a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all right. So we're getting close to being out of time. But let's. the last thing is maybe you guys might have something about is um, Granny and Olin, um, these vicaries, a lot of people in the hills, they kind of do handle situations unconventionally. Um, and I'm just wondering if you know of like if somebody who has done that and really kind of surprised you at how something was handled, maybe kind of like Olin with the two Joshes that we talked about on the bus or Granny like dunking Henry and telling him it's scalding hot water, something like that. Um, so nowadays it's unheard of parents hitting their children, but growing up, you know, my parents hit me, my parents hit my sisters. And, you know, I know how it felt to be hit with the belt. Uh, but there's one specific story that I remember um, my older sister, I, I specifically don't remember what she did, but she was in trouble. And the whole day we waited for my dad to come from work because my mom said, just wait till your father gets home. Uh -oh. And uh -oh. that's my, the way yeah, is so, worse than anything else. Right. And so my <laughs> sister and I, you know, we were waiting and like my dad got home and I mean, this is going to sound really cruel, but, you know, he was a smoker, and so he told my sister to put your hand out. And so she put her hand out, and he took his cigarette, and he put it right in the middle of her oh, hand. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and, you know, it left a little mark, and it burned, and, you know, she was crying, crying, crying. And he only did it for a second, and it just stuck with me, like... That is just mean. And, like, that never happened to me. But 
just seeing probably preventative. Yeah, and seeing that happen to her, it made me first. It made me curious, like what, like now thinking about it, what what did she do that deserved something like that? And I I can't remember. Um, and I I didn't have a chance to ask my mom yet, but I I think I was a pretty good kid after that. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I I mean that's just scary. I can't imagine. Nowadays, if you, like, smack a kid and someone, like, you know, you smack your own kid, someone sees that, you could end up in jail. So totally. You could lose yeah. your kids. But something like that back then, I can't really imagine anything like that now. Well, I'm going to tell a discipline story. This is my husband, who is brilliant. My daughter was, I don't even remember, but she was, I don't even remember what triggered it, but she was... 11 years old and just full of being 11 years old angst. And she slammed the door of her bedroom and just didn't slam doors in our house. And she then slammed the door again for emphasis. And my husband said, you slam that door one more time and there won't be a door for you to slam. And she slammed the door again. And my husband, who is a mild kind of a guy, went down the stairs, got up the proper tools, took the door off the hinges, and that door was off the hinges for a week. And that was just, he didn't say a word. And of course, he didn't touch her. He didn't do anything. But boy, that door was off the hinges. And I guess when you're 11 years old and... If you don't have a door on your room, that's probably that's, worse that's than death. Very bad. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's a that's actually a good one. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and that was it. And and um her younger sister never slammed the door. And as far as I can recall, she never slammed that door again. That was probably the best lesson that we could teach our daughter as parents. And he was brilliant. I would have never come up with that. I would have done, I don't know what, I, I wouldn't have done that because what your father did to you because we weren't smokers, but. <laughs> that wasn't a possibility. That wasn't a possibility. <laughs> but, but my husband just took the door off the hinges. That's really smart. Yeah. That's something actually I learned uh, right now. I'm in uh, childhood and adolescence, a psychology class. And that's an example that my psychology teacher actually gave of disciplining a child. We had a whole section on different discipline. Taking the door off the hinges? Yeah, and that's really that's one of like maybe maybe that's an example. Not, I thought that was such such so original. Th that is genius, but like that's like one of the examples. <laughs> but not original genius. <laughs> right. She she actually gave so that, I was like I was like, Well, I would have never thought of that, but I mean I guess other people have thought of that and that's yeah. like that is an actual example, I guess. Yeah, right now I have it an 11 year old who slams some doors sometimes. So you got some ideas. <laughs> I got a lot of good ideas today. <laughs> not the cigarette one, though. No, Don't well, use that one, definitely. No. Also, not smokers. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> <Okay>. safe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abdullah and Monica. We're out of time for today. Tune in next time for our very last podcast in this series. Until then, dream big and have fun.